to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I am Jeff Cliff. This is my weekly blog slash podcast slash record of the time slash alternative to the RIAA, the MPAA, the IFPI, Netflix, and Spotify, which is kind of ironic because this broadcast is available on Spotify. So if you are by some miracle hearing this broadcast on Spotify, please turn this dial off. Don't listen to Spotify. Spotify is terrible. It has a terrible impact on the world. It is a tool of the Recording Industry Association of America to enslave you and control what you can listen to and control the future of music in this world. Take your money and do not give it to Spotify. If you're currently a subscriber, please disconnect. However, for the rest of us, this is a window into the world and my life as I know it. And this broadcast is available on Mega, NSA Alphabet YouTube, on CIA Facebook. And I'm going to try to make this episode available on BitTorrent and to have a magnet link wherever this video is posted. But as well, it should be available on Buzzsprout as well. And if you have any idea of where you would like to hear this broadcast, please send me a message. I'd love to have more places to host it, more places to post it, more places where people can have access to it. There is a lot of problems with the main platforms like Google and Facebook, where people across the world don't have access to them. I was just speaking with a woman this week from Russia who just doesn't have access to Facebook at all. Uh, and she's probably not alone. There are millions of people who can't see this video live on Facebook, but I would like to broadcast to them. And if you know of a way for me to reach them, please get in touch. In the meanwhile, uh, as usual, I don't have any guests this week. As you might be able to hear, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather and my throat is not as functional as I perhaps would like it to be. However, I'm going to try to march through this episode. We'll see how far I get. In the meanwhile, I do have some music for you to enjoy. I don't know if I played either of these two songs yet. I really should go back and double check which songs I have and haven't played. But I think both of them kind of capture the mood of the week. So uh, let's give both of them a listen and then I'll talk about each of them in turn after the musical break. Hopefully you enjoy and hopefully this is coming through okay. I guess I should probably be recording on my second microphone. I totally forgot that. I think I'll go grab that while the music is playing. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that was Same Puzzle, Different Piece uh, by me, of all people. That was the first song. That is actually my most popular song on Last FM. I don't know why that one compared to all the other ones, but especially Last Puzzle, Different Piece, I think is personally a stronger, better put together thing, but uh, people seem to enjoy that. So I can't really fault them for enjoying my music. And then the second piece uh, was one by Vabric. Uh, or at least by Triad, his band, his old band, under the album Listen, uh, the song Lovely. And I think it's a pretty catchy tune. And I've even got 
uh, the delay pedal. Um, I haven't got it plugged in because I'm missing a cable for it right now. But I'd love to be able to just sort of practice a little bit and get it back and into my memory. I had learned most of it in the past, but I haven't played it in a while. And so uh, I did actually invite Fabric onto this show uh, this week. And I don't know if he just didn't get my message or if he totally ignored it or what. But uh, Vavrik, if you're out there, you had your chance to be on this show and to spread your music far and wide, and you missed it. But oh well, he's a cool guy, so uh, I, I do enjoy that song and that whole album. So if you have a bored hour or two this upcoming week, definitely go out and grab Triad's album. And so what else has gone on this past two weeks? Uh, last week, I, for the first time in 40 plus weeks, didn't have a show. I just took a week off, and so... I don't want to stop this stream. Please don't stop this stream, Facebook. But there was things still going on in the world over the past two weeks. And the, but before I get to that, though, I do want to point out, I, in the last, I think it was in the last show, I made the point that the conservatives didn't even pretend to try to be fiscal conservatives in the last election. And I think that was actually stretching a little bit. They did pretend. <laughs> in fact, a balanced budget was part of their agenda, or at least something close to a balanced budget. Now, we all know they would have never balanced the budget. They've said that they would balance the budget in the past, and the Harper government didn't balance the budget. The Mulroney government didn't balance the budget. Uh, Joe Clark didn't balance the budget. Uh, if you go back, at least as far as I've been alive, the conservatives don't balance budgets. And so when they say they're going to balance the budget, you just don't listen to them because they aren't going to anyway. It's, it's really not that... Uh, worth paying attention to. In the meanwhile, though, uh, as I mentioned, there are things that did go on this week. Uh, the first, I have a link from Common Dreams. I think I got this one from Dr. Roy Shestowitz. Quote, arms expert warns of reckless and unnecessary escalation after Pentagon tests missile banned by INF treaty that Trump ditched. Quote, the move could exacerbate tensions with China or Russia, China, and North Korea, all of whom would be in the range of this type of missile. So you may remember that a couple of, epi or quite a few episodes ago, I think, I talked about the INF Treaty and how Trump and Putin have risked the whole world's safety and the lives of all of us listening by scrapping this treaty and just going ahead with building uh, long-range nuclear weapons and being open to the world and saying that, yes, we're going to build these long-range nuclear weapons. And so... Quote, arms experts warned of negative global implications after the Pentagon on Thursday test launched a second missile that would have been banned under the Cold War era treaty that U.S. President Donald Trump ditched in early August. Trump ignored concerns about the impacts on global security and formally withdrew from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces INF Treaty after suspending U.S. obligations under the deal in February and giving Russian President Vladimir Putin six months to destroy weapons that the U.S. government and NATO deemed non-compliant with bilateral agreement. The deal outlawed land-launched missiles with a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers, or about 310 to 3,400 miles. So pause. If you live in, oh, I don't know, anywhere in Canada, uh, look at a map and look to see how far 5,500 kilometers is from where you live. Because chances are it's a pretty broad area, uh, and especially up north, that probably includes uh, the shores of Russia, or at least Russian territory. So that puts us within striking distance. Uh, so anyway, continuing on. The Pentagon announced Thursday that it successfully conducted a test flight of a prototype conventionally configured ground-launched ballistic missile from a pad at Vandenberg Air Base in California. Pentagon spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Robert Carver told Defense One that data collected and lessons learned from this test will inform the Department of Defense development of future intermediate range capabilities. Carver said that the missile flew more than 500 kilometers and landed in the ocean. And when they talk about how this is reckless and how they're not sure when they're going to be deploying this into a real production system, I quote, we could deploy such a missile in Guam, but its survivability wouldn't be assured there, Reef told the journal, referring to China's ability to strike U.S. territory, which is located 2,000 miles from North Korea and 1,800 miles from China in the western Pacific Ocean. Quote, sounds like the U.S. defense posturing is dancing to the pipe of the defense contractors rather than being the result of deliberative defense strategy. That was one Hans Christensen continuing on. In late August, within a few weeks of, or of the Trump administration exiting the treaty that was signed in 1987, paused by Reagan, which was one of Trump's 
idols, so it's kind of weird that he would undo the work of Reagan there. The Pentagon fired a Tomahawk land attack missile from a mobile ground launcher at St. Nicholas Island, California. The move also alarmed arms experts and disarmament advocates who declared that the nuclear weapons arms race is here. See, the weird thing about this is that it may not seem like a big deal, but there's a lot of we are kind of at a, a stability point where any change like this can lead to reactions from the Russians, the North Koreans, the Chinese governments, and that in turn will lead to a reaction by the US and other um, NATO governments. And so the end result of those reactions and the reactions to the reactions and the reactions to the reactions to the reactions can get out of control. And we've had for quite a few years, since 1987, maybe things have been slowly getting worse on the side of China and Russia, but not a lot has changed year over year. And so when something like this happens, we really do have to pay attention because this really does threaten international security and the security and safety of every single person listening to this broadcast. So continuing on, this is a bigger deal than the Tomahawk on a trailer ground launch cruise missile test in August, which itself was a big deal, Reef wrote. If it's ever deployed, a 3,000 to 4,000 kilometer ground launched IRBM could promptly strike deep into Russia and China and North Korea. According to Russia's state owned news agency TASS, uh, which by the way, if you don't read TASS, like put it on your list of checks because uh, they do have an English language feed and it's sometimes you, interesting to pull their point of view. Anyway, Russian presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov told his reporters. Friday, we said more than once that the United States has been making preparations for violating the INF Treaty. This missile test clearly confirms that the treaty was ruined at the initiative of the United States. Well, both sides are going to say the other side, of course, where it was the cause of the treaty not working, but oh, it takes two to tango here, and uh, both sides are equally guilty at this point. Continuing on, putting the test into a broader context, the AP noted, the test comes amid growing uncertainty about the future of arms control, the last remaining treaty limitation on U.S. and nuclear weapons, the New START Treaty of 2010, is scheduled to expire in February 2021. That treaty can be extended for as long as five years without requiring a renegotiation of its main terms. The Trump administration has indicated little interest in doing so. So in the case of the United States, they're actually faced with an election right now and an impeachment proceeding. I'm not going to go into too much about the election and the impeachment proceedings, however, the uh, important thing to note is that there is a choice in the United States right now that the Democrats, they haven't chosen their front runner yet. There's a lot of variation in terms of who the Democrats could pick to lead the country. And there isn't so much of a question on the Republican side as far as I'm aware. I think it's just Trump so far, which means that if Trump is not willing to renegotiate this, and is not willing to follow up on Reagan's peace treaties with Russia, then the world really does face the prospect of a lot more danger and a lot closer chance of getting to global nuclear war. And that is actually a choice the Americans can choose to pursue if they choose Trump. So it's interesting uh, to, to consider that. Continuing on, the test also followed bipartisan approval. Pause. It's not entirely a choice, though, of course. The NDAA uh, the military budget was bipartisan. The Democrats voted for it. They gave Trump the money that he asked for, $738 billion U.S., to pursue stuff like nuclear missiles. So maybe you don't get quite as much choice, but a little bit of choice here. Anyway, continuing on. In the Democrat-controlled U.S. House of Representatives, the military spending bill, which gives Trump the Space Force as well as the ability to continue waging endless wars and fueling the humanitarian catastrophe in Yemen, is expected to soon pass the GOP-controlled Senate. And so the important thing here is that, yes, Trump is a big wiener, sure, but whether or not he's a big wiener, we're, our lives are at risk because of him. And when our lives are at risk because of him, a little bit more extreme action starts to be called for. Um, I'm not really necessarily going to agree with Antifa's approach, for example, of dealing with people they consider to be far-right or Nazis or whatever. But at least we can understand if the choice is between a world destroyed by nuclear war or whatever the Democrats have. I mean, the Democrats have to have something. I mean, last election they didn't really credibly have an alternative, at least on the nuclear war side. 
uh, with Russia being really, really nervous of the prospect of a Hillary Clinton presidency. But this time they can, they can have that choice. And if they do choose some kind of real politic or otherwise approach that leads to a decrease in the chance of nuclear war, then it seems reasonable to imagine that you could have extreme actions uh, directed against the Republicans to just stop them from getting power. And it would be justified under the context of, well, at least we're not heading to nuclear war. Uh, so that's something to think about anyway. But that's that particular story. The next one I've got is from the ICLMG, which I've actually got their website up here. Let's see, it's the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. They send me a pretty much weekly email about the various things happening in Canada as far as civil liberties are concerned. But one of the emails they sent a little while ago, this is not back in November actually, was about the Sidewalk Labs plans for Toronto. And so there's this whole neighborhood in Toronto going on where basically the... Why is there a snowflake? There's like a snowflake going on my live feed. What is this about? Who put a snowflake on my feed? Anyway, Toronto Sidewalk Labs, a smart city project, is basically a really, really big budget project in Toronto to develop a whole part of the waterfront to be a, quote, smart city and to give Google a, a great deal of control over the data which would be collected as part of this uh, mass surveillance system. And there's a lot of details that we could probably go into how exactly this worked, but let's, let's see what they say about it. So court challenge to Waterfront Toronto Sidewalk Labs Smart City continues. CCLA, that's the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Good group. Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs have been negotiating to determine whether everything pitched in the overreaching 1,500 plus pages of the Master Innovation Development Plan should be considered in the final evaluation process. Today's announcement is that the Waterfront Toronto has decided to limit the scope of what they will consider. But the real question is not whether the project should be 12 acres or 190. It's not whether there can or should be a guarantee of transit to the precinct. It's not even who should control the data collected, because that framing presupposes that the data should be collected in the streets, buildings, and homes, i.e. private homes, of people who live in that area of the neighborhood in the first place. Pause. So when they're talking about data collected, what, what exactly do they mean? Well, what they mean is the, there are going to be computers lining this place, possibly in the cement, uh, possibly with microphones everywhere, possibly with and, and lamps and street lights and video cameras and you name it. They're going to be pulling data in every way that they can. And the Internet of Things has built thousands and thousands of ways of, of watching what goes on in an area, whether it be human beings doing those things, being watched or otherwise. And so there is going to be these computers watching people in using possibly artificial intelligence from so many different vantage points that it's, it's going to be an implementation of 1984 in practice. Uh, so anyway, continuing on, the question is whether any version of this particular smart city project should continue. The CCLA believes the answer to this question should have been no. The project needs a reset, not just a retrenchment. Since it was not, we will continue with our lawsuit. The decision by the Waterfront Toronto to continue considering, yeah, probably, <laughs> where were we here? Uh, decision by Waterfront Toronto to continue considering and consulting and partnering with Google, sibling Sidewalk Labs, i.e. Uh, Sidewalk Labs is probably part of Alphabet, to build 12 acres of infrastructure embedded with sensors to collect data from the public takes us back to where we began with the proposal two years ago. In our litigation, we argue that the Waterfront Toronto simply doesn't have the jurisdiction to have entered into this deal in the first place. We further argue that the deal will lead to violations of the Charter Produce Rights to Privacy, Liberty and Free Association in a sensor-laden, intensely surveilled landscape that is planned to extend into the streets, shops or even homes. Waterfront Toronto and the three levels of government who are parties to our litigation should now have no further reason to delay the hearing of our case. We continue to push Waterfront Toronto and the governments to set a date to have this challenge determined by the court. So what is going on? They're taking them to court. They're trying to stop this. Uh, the Google is, of course, an agent and partner of the U.S. government. So this, all this data is going right into the hands of the NSA and CSIS in people's private homes. They're going to be watched. They're going to be listened to. And trends are going to be uh, recorded and acted upon. And the whole thing is going to just be alive. Uh, the whole, you're not going to be able to have any sense of privacy whatsoever in this whole area. And the weird thing is, is I've heard people talk about this sort of thing in other cities as well. Specifically Thunder Bay. There's a lot of talk of making Thunder Bay into a smart city. 
and to have surveillance cameras and AI watching the surveillance cameras and have microphones listening to everything around us all the time. But it's just a bizarre thing to want, right? Even just, just for the children, right? To have nowhere where children can go where they can escape their parents and peers judging them for what they do and what they say and what they, or how they react to things. And the amount of emotional pressure that, that puts on children alone, it's a huge amount of anxiety to know that, oh, there's literally nowhere where you can go that you can have some reprieve from your parents, from your the people who are bullying you at school. It is amazing how much pressure this would put on kids to have an entire neighborhood of 100, what, 190 acres where as far as you can walk in every direction, to have no privacy whatsoever, and to have everything recorded and given to the U.S. government. This is total dominance by the U.S. government in this area. This would be terrible for political activists and organizers trying to make, for example, some kind of an impression against the trade agreement uh, that could come around, or maybe some other policy that people don't approve of that the executive in the United States, maybe the development of nuclear missiles, Right? Being able to subvert it, people's most private and vulnerable moments in their, in their homes with technology is not something we should be cheering on. It's, it is something we should resist if we can. But it goes further than that. And this is where I got on the email in November. Quote, the leaked document reveals that Sidewalk Labs Toronto's plans for private taxation, private roads, charter school, corporate cops, and judges in punishment for people who choose privacy. So in other words, when you, there are going to be laws set by Google or Alphabet, the branch of the NSA, and if you break those laws, you're going to be faced with a judge owned by Google or Sidewalk Labs or whatever. The judge is going to judge against you based not on laws that you could vote for, but the shareholders of Alphabet. There's going to be cops who can arrest you and har harass you. Again, not controlled by the city of Toronto, not controlled by a taxpayer, not uh, subject to any kind of oversight that would be democratically controlled. Uh, charter schools, so this is going to be very private education, uh, so a very regressive system uh, for keeping people who can't afford so said charter schools from being educated or having their children educated private roads again very regressive thing keeping people from being able to travel freely and private taxation which is a bizarre thing that i haven't heard barely anything about until i think this year or two where i heard something else i think it was amazon where they managed to make an agreement with chicago where their employees instead of paying taxes to the state or the city or something like that wound up just paying taxes to amazon which is bizarre and it's not something that, again, you have any say over whatsoever once it gets passed. So that is taxation without representation. It is taxation without you being able to choose as a member of your community, no matter how the scale of your community, how much that tax should be. And it's left entirely to the people who run the community as far as what that tax will be. Now it's, I mean, you can imagine it kind of like an extra form of rent, but no, this is this is really biz bizarre. It's a new way of approaching how to extract profit from people who just want to live in an area. So it's really extreme, and uh, I, I liken it to Shadowrun. Like it's it's that that absurd to imagine that all this privatized, air, completely privatized area, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But uh, definitely good on the Canadian Civil Liberties Association for finding it. Now that's again not the only thing going on in the world. I have one thing that is actually from a little while back. Uh, this is from April 2002. Uh, and let's see, what, what is the date on this one? I hope this is from April 1st. It's an RFC. What RFCs are is a set of documents that define how the internet works and what the internet is. And so that you, if you want to understand how parts of the internet work, you just go read the RFC. And if you have a programmer or know a programmer or are capable of programming, you can write code, and as long as it abides by the RFC, it should work with all the other uh, software out there that makes the internet work. This one isn't so much a software or a protocol issue. This is more of a social question. Uh, so what is this one? This is RFC, or Re Request for Comment, 
3271. They call them requests for comments, by the way, because once they propose them, the goal is to get a whole bunch of feedback from everyone on the internet. And if there's any problems with it, then at least they've tried to get feedback. They've tried to get people to, to give them suggestions of how it could be better. And uh, so anyway, continuing on. The internet is for everyone, the status of this memo. This memo provides information for the internet community. I, if you're listening to this, that includes you. It does not specify an internet standard of any kind. Distribution of this memo is unlimited. Uh, internet standard in this case is a term of art. That just means that it doesn't uh, specify technical uh, details that must be followed. It doesn't necessarily uh, say that it shouldn't be a standard. Anyway, continuing on. Copyright uh, Internet Society 2002. Well, we're kind of breaking that, but hey, oh well. Abstract. This document expresses the Internet Society's ideology that the Internet really is for everyone. However, it will only be such if we make it so. How easy to say, how hard to achieve. Have we progressed towards this noble goal? The Internet is in its 14th year of annual doubling since 1988. It more or less continued that until it finally, I think, has been slowing down as there's not much left to connect. Anyway, continuing on. There are over 500, or 150 million hosts on the internet, and an estimated for 513 million users worldwide. By 2006, the global internet is likely to exceed the size of the global telephone network, if it has not already become the telephone network by virtue of IP telephony. Moreover, as many as 1.5 billion network or internet-enabled appliances will have joined traditional servers, desktops, and laptops as part of the internet family. Pagers, cell phones, and personal digital assistants may well have merged to become the new telecommunications tool of the next decade. But even at the scale of the telephone system, it is sobering to realize that only half of the Earth's population has ever made a telephone call. It is estimated that commerce on the network will reach somewhere between 1.8 trillion and 3.2 trillion by 2003. That is only two years from now, but a long career in internet years. The number of internet users will likely reach over 100,000 million by the end of the year 2005, but that is only 16% of the world's population. By 2047, the world's population may reach about 11 billion. If only 25% of the world's population is on the internet, that will be nearly 3 billion users. I think we're actually past that at this point, so we're actually doing better than that. As high bandwidth access becomes the norm through digital subscriber loops, cable modems, and digital terrestrial and satellite radio links, the convergence of media available on the internet will become obvious. Television, radio, telephony, and traditional print media will find counterparts on the internet and will be changed in profound ways by the presence of software that performs the one-way media into interactive resources shareable by many. Pause. This is, by the way, what is so very wrong with the Trudeau government giving $600 million to traditional print media uh, because it tilts the scale back. It tries to fight windmills. It tries to push back against a change that has been coming for decades uh, to slowly change print media in ways that we are not going to expect, or at least we didn't expect 20 years ago, and or 30 years ago even. And that the forms of media that can handle this change are and continue to be successful. And the forms of media that will assume that everything will just continue to be the same, well, they're still alive because they got $600 million of subsidies to continue to exist. But they're not going to survive unless the government continues to fund them, and that makes them reliant on the government for their funds and their long-term survival, which also makes them beholden to the government when the government wishes to control what they say. Maybe not now, but in a couple of years. Scary to imagine what the conservatives could have done with the ability to veto. I mean, they kind of already do have the ability to veto what happens in our press, uh, because they tend to own the press, but just having a direct control like that would be another step. Anyway, the internet is proving to be one of the most powerful amplifiers of speech ever invented. It offers the global megaphone for voices that might otherwise be heard only feebly, and if at all. It ignites and facilitates multiple points of view and dialogue in ways unimplementable by traditional one-way mass media. The internet can facilitate democratic practices in unexpected ways. Did you know that proxy voting for stock shareholders is now commonly supported on the internet? 
Perhaps we can find additional ways in which to simplify and expand the voting franchise in other domains, including the political, as access to internet increases. The internet is becoming the repository of all we have accomplished as a society. It has become a kind of disorganized Boswell of the human spirit. I'm not sure what that means. Be thoughtful in what you commit to email news groups and other internet communication channels. It may well turn up in a web search someday. Thanks to online access to common repositories, shared databases on the internet are acting to accelerate the pace of research progress. The internet is moving off the planet. Already, interplanetary internet is part of NASA's Mars mission program, now underway at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. By 2008, which we should have a well-functioning Earth-Mars network that serves as a nascent backbone of an inter interplanetary system of internets. Interplanet is a network of internets. Ultimately, we will have interplanetary internet relays in the polar solar orbit so that they can see most of the planets and with their associated interplanetary gateways for most, if not all of the time. The Internet Society is launching a new campaign to facilitate access to and use of Internet everywhere. The campaign's slogan is, Internet is for everyone. But there is much work needed to accomplish this objective. It, and the Internet is for everyone, but it won't be if it isn't affordable by all that wish to partake of its services. So we must dedicate ourselves to making the Internet as affordable as other infrastructures so critical to our well-being. While we follow Moore's law to reduce the cost of Internet and enabling equipment, let us also seek to stimulate regulatory policies that take advantage of power of competition to reduce cost. Pause. This is particularly stinging in the current day and age in Canada because our internet is some of the most expensive connections in the world and the Trudeau government is insistent on making it more expensive at least with its most recent actions and yet all four of the major parties have in their platform that they want to expand rural at least broadband connections that they want to make it cheaper that they want to subsidize at least rural Canadians Canadians in the boonies to have access to the internet and that doesn't really help those of us who live in a city, but we at least have some choice. They may not be a very good choice. It may be between Shaw and Telus or Shaw and Sastel or something like that. There's not much of a choice available. We have a little bit more of a better uh, access to connectivity than the people in the boonies. So, uh, as I've said before, and I'll say again, all of the parties should be cooperating on getting rural broadband working. This is something that should be a consensus. They should be able to work together on, despite their differences elsewhere, and just make it happen. Uh, but anyway, continuing along. The internet is for everyone, but it won't be if governments restrict access to it. Pause. Like happening in Kashmir right now. Like happening in Iran. Like happening in China. As in, like it's happening in Australia. And as the Unifor would like to implement here in Canada. Uh, they would have... The government have the ability to restrict who can and cannot connect continuing on so we must dedicate ourselves to keeping the network unrestricted unfettered and unregulated we must have the freedom to speak and the freedom to hear the internet is for everyone but it won't be if it cannot keep up with the explosive demand for its services so we must dedicate ourselves to continuing its technological evolution and development of the technical standards that lie at the heart of the Internet Revolution. Let us dedicate ourselves to the support of the Internet Architecture Board, their Internet Engineering Steering Group, the Internet Research Task Force, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and other organizations dedicated to developing Internet technology as they drive us towards an unbounded future. Pause. Some of these organizations have, by the way, been party to things like the Christchurch Call. And so some of them, over the long term, didn't. it wasn't just important that they get it right the first time. That was important. And, I mean, it was 20 years ago that this stuff was written by Lux Bed. And it wasn't hard work, and they did a good job at it. But in the long haul, there's another problem that comes up. Because these groups have a great deal of political power. And so they're targets for people who wish to implement their will on the rest of the world. And because of their global scope, and the fact that they're probably mostly technical people who are interested in making a technical solution to a social problem. They're vulnerable to bad actors coming in from the outside and making the progress that they've accomplished over the decades 
usable as a tool of social oppression and then restricting people's access to the internet. The internet is for everyone, but it won't be until every home, in every business, in every school, in every library, in every hospital, in every town, in every country of the globe, the internet can be accessed without limitation at any time and in every language. That is something that we're still working on, by the way. There's uh, lots of languages out there that you just probably can't uh, negotiate the basic services of the internet of. I mean, I don't know enough Cree to know whether, for example, Facebook has a Cree interface. Uh, does it? I don't even know. Uh, but that, that's just one language. There are lots of languages out there, uh, much smaller than Cree in both uh, geographical distribution and number of speakers, uh, that things should be in, or things should be available in, or available to translate in. Continuing on, internet is for everyone, but it won't be if it is too complex to be used easily by everyone. Let us dedicate ourselves to the task of simplifying the internet's interfaces and to educating all that are interested in its use. Part of this, by the way, involves not allowing proprietary software, including things like Facebook, with its just jungle of JavaScript, to proliferate. Now, we didn't do a very good job of this over the past 20 years. There have been a lot of uh, room, there's a lot of room for improvement here. But anyway, continuing on. The internet is for everyone, but it won't be if legislation around the world creates a thicket of incompatible laws that hinder the growth of electronic commerce, steaming the side protection of intellectual property. Oh, oh, Vitzer, why did you go there? No, 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 no. He has that totally back, ass backwards. It's actually the other way around. It's protection of users from companies willing copyrights, patents, and trademarks to prevent people from communicating online. But whatever, he got one thing wrong. Continuing on. Stifle freedom of expression and the development of market economies. Let us dedicate ourselves to the creation of a global legal framework in which the laws work across national boundaries to reinforce the upward spiral value that the internet is capable of creating. Of course, the upper spiral value will be facilitated when people share and, and trade valuable things, including culture, but he was still writing in an age of ignorance as of 20 years ago. Things like free culture hadn't been written yet, and the free software movement was a lot smaller. So perhaps he can be forgiven. I mean, boomers don't get everything right, right? So uh, the internet is for everyone, but it won't be if its users cannot protect their privacy and the confidentiality of transactions conducted on the network. This is, of course, seven years written, seven years before Bitcoin and, uh, what was it? 13 years before Zcash existed, and here they are calling for confidential private transactions. Continuing on, let us dedicate ourselves to the proposition that cryptographic technology sufficient to protect privacy from unauthorized disclosure should be freely available, applicable, and exportable, of course. When they're saying exportable, they're talking about the export restriction laws that were probably still in place in the United States at the time that this was written, meaning that you could go to jail for trying to teach math or certain applications of math over the border. People tried to get around this because they had a right to publish books. And so they would send books with source code across the border. And that was for a while kind of sketchy. People got tattoos of the code on their arms and tried to have the government arrest them. And so they traveled across borders. They wore t-shirts with the code on it. There was a whole bunch of lawsuits. Eventually the, the side of freedom in crypto won and people gain the ability to to trade crypto across the border but we are fighting that fight again today with the second crypto war happening so anyway continuing on moreover as authenticity lies at the heart of trust in networked environments let us dedicate ourselves to work towards the development of authentication methods and systems capable of supporting electronic commerce through the internet this one gets pause this one gets especially important in the age of deep fakery because what is an is not authentic is starting to blur. For all you know, this whole video is a deep fake. There's nothing saying that it couldn't be uh, other than who would make this video with a deep fake engine, really. But as time goes on, we're gonna need ways of dealing with the problem of authenticity, ways of proving that we're dealing with human beings on the internet. Uh, and crypto is there to help us with that, but maybe that's not the only thing we need uh, for that particular battle. I know Occulte Veritatis is, if they haven't done an episode on this very question, going to be doing an episode. So I'm going to link to Occulte Veritatis so that you in the future can go back and check to see if they made that episode yet. Uh, that's a podcast for those of you who have not heard it. 
such as me. I still haven't heard any of the episodes yet, but uh, I'm I'm aware of what's in the the content in them, so it's a uh, it should be a good listen anyway. Continuing on, the internet is for everyone, and, but it won't be if parents and teachers cannot voluntarily create protected spaces for our young people for whom the full range of internet content may still or still may be inappropriate. Let us dedicate ourselves to the development of technologies and practices that offer this protective flexibility to those who accept responsibility for providing it. And this is a dangerous thing to start with, but at the same time, like I've seen enough of the internet to know that maybe some parts of it children shouldn't necessarily be have it free open access to. Like uh, there's definitely stuff that I wouldn't uh, want to show up to the children at my workplace. Put it that way. The internet is for everyone, but it won't be if we are not responsible in its use and mindful of the rights of others who share its wealth. Let us dedicate ourselves to the responsible use of this new medium and to the proposition that with the, or with the freedom the internet enables comes a commensurate responsibility to use these powerful enablers with care and consideration. For those who choose to abuse these privileges, let us dedicate ourselves to developing the necessary tools to combat the abuse and to punish the abuser. Pause. But notice, notice here, the abuser is still part of everyone, the people that we hate, the people who do things and say things that are terrible, things, people who cross picket lines, the people who are Nazis, and who here in Saskatoon, there are Nazis putting up posters all over the city. It's bizarre, it's surreal. And there are people out there who, should, who say that Nazis shouldn't be allowed on the internet, that Nazis shouldn't be allowed on our networks, that Nazis shouldn't be allowed, you know, X, Y, and Z. Maybe they should be punished. Maybe there is there is something to be done to combat them. I'm totally on online with that. But they're still part of everyone. Who else could we we pick as our? Uh, oh yeah, the Christchurch call. People who who call for for action against their outgroups. People who speak favorably of uh, certain topics that are not legal to speak favor favorably of in Canada. There's all kinds of people in that list is expanding year after year who the call is out to keep them off the internet or at least off of the network platforms. But here we are at RFC 3271 with something of a commandment for us to try to live up to. That as we develop the tools to combat abuse, and that even includes cyberbullying, as is, is much as most of the time people screw that one up when they try to combat it, it is worth talking about and thinking about ways to deal with. And there's all kinds of social problems, all kinds of asocial activity or antisocial activity, all kinds of harms that can happen when different groups and individuals deal with each other. And punishment may be involved and may be desirable for those situations. But nevertheless, the internet is for everyone. And we should remember that the internet is also for the people that we don't want on the internet. Continuing on, the internet is for everyone, even Martians. I hope internauts everywhere will join with the Internet Society and like-minded organizations to achieve this easily stated but hard to attain goal. As we pass the milestone of the beginning of the third millennium, what better theme could we possibly ask for than making the Internet the medium of this new millennium? The Internet is for everyone, but it won't be unless we make it so. Security Considerations This document does not treat security matters except for reference to the utilities of cryptographic techniques protect confidentiality and privacy. And it lists some references, uh, which is mostly a link to the websites, uh, the internet addresses of the particular groups mentioned and then mentions who wrote this, which is Vint Cerf, quote, former chairman and president of the Internet Society and senior vice president of the Internet Architecture and Technology and Technology in WorldCom. And then uh, give some uh, copyright notices which we're totally breaking by reading this along but it's an rfc for christ's sake i mean this is the thing that determines how the internet works so uh i am uh, not really ashamed of pirating and broadcasting this openly so the the point here though is that we can be sometimes tempted to silence to kick people off of our network i mean i blacklist github from my network personally but in the long run we really should be connected there should be a medium an international medium and if there is any damage in that medium keeping people from communicating we should label it as such we should treat it as damage and route around it that is the way the internet works 
That is the way the world should work. Anyway. Uh, how are we doing for... Oh, we've been going on a little bit longer than usual, but... I wanted to also read what else the uh, International Civil, Civil Liberties Monitoring Group has been up to, or is plans to get up to in the next year, because I think it's worth considering, not, not necessarily donating to them, but uh, just seeing what they're up to, because that kind of gives you a clue of what the uh, status quo is like here in Canada. Quote, you're looking... To a busy year at 20 or a busy year 2020 we will continue to call for a publicly a public inquiry into dr hassan diab's case and reform of the extradition act we'll talk about that case maybe later we will continue to fight to stop mohammed harkett's deportation to torture and for public safety minister to allow him to stay in canada we will monitor the implementation of the national security act of 2017 formerly bill 50 c59 especially around mass surveillance and immunity for CSIS employees in order to protect, to protect our civil liberties. We will continue to push for a strong and effective review mechanism for the Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA. We will continue advocating for the repeal of the Canadian no-fly list as it violates mobility rights and due process and for putting a stop to the use of the U.S. US no-fly list by air carriers in Canada for flights that do not land or fly in or fly over the U.S. as it violates both our rights and Canada's sovereignty. So just a little things to look forward to as we come up to the new year. We are getting to the end of the year, the end of the past five years, and the end of the decade, which is going to mean a lot of looking back to see how things happened and what happened over the past decade. But it is also important to keep an eye on the future because it is the future that we have to look forward to. These struggles, the struggle against CSIS in 2020, that is something that we can participate in. This is something that we can help fund if we had a little bit of spare change to throw out the ICLMG and the CCLA. It is something that we could think about and, and publish, maybe letters to the newspaper. We can get our friends and family involved in these sorts of things. Uh, at the very least, we can be aware of them. And so with that in mind, I am going to end this show as usual. If you have enjoyed this broadcast and would like to see me continue to not have weeks like last week where things just sort of fell through the floor, definitely check out my subscriber stars, subscriberstars.com slash Jeff dash cliff. Otherwise, uh, get in touch if you have any creative comments or music you'd like me to play or any stories or anything you'd like me to talk about or anyone you'd like me to talk with as a guest, perhaps. And as usual, I'm going to close off with the goodbye song. So hopefully you enjoyed this broadcast. I will see you all next.